All right, if you'd open your Bibles, please, to, here we go. If you'd open your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. When you go back through into the Old Testament and start reading some of the stories of the kings and you know Samuel, that's what we've actually been doing in uh, Wednesday nights. We've been going through First Samuel. We haven't gotten to this point yet, but eventually we'll get to David, King David. What we find really is he's finally able to establish his kingdom and, and uh, be king, be king over the entire kingdom, and he has his palace built and all this kind of stuff. And there's one day he just kind of looks out and he just takes notice, you know, I've got this beautiful palace. I've got this beautiful thing in which I get to live in. And he looks out the window and he can see here's God's house, so to speak, but it's just, it's a tabernacle, it's a tent. And he just kind of bothers him a little bit. It's like, it doesn't make any sense right here because he might have this nice house, God's living in a tent. Like, that doesn't make sense anymore. At one point in time, it did. At one point in time, it had to be mobile. They were packing it up. They would move it around. They would put it back together and, and do all that. But it, by this point in time, this tent is hundreds of years old. It's, it's, it probably is destined for or, uh, uh, crying out for a replacement, all those kinds of things. And, and he's like, why not now? And it bothered him because there's just something about living in a tent that just says, like, it's not permanent. We're not moving this around anymore. It's not permanent. And Israel probably understood that more so than anyone else. Even to this day, sometimes, if, I forget exactly when, when, when they do it, but there's the Feast of Booths or the Feast of, of Tents, uh, Tabernacles, if you will. And, and so the Jews, for a, a, a little bit of time, will actually construct some kind of a temporary structure, usually just on the back of their own homes. But it's a reminder of that time of the wilderness wanderings, when they were living in tents, when they were living in just kind of rudimentary structures that were not really home. They were just temporary because they were going to have to take it down and move it on again. It wasn't a permanent dwelling. They knew that, and it wasn't for the long haul. And that's really the logic that Paul's using here in this passage as we look at it. He's looking at this concept of, of, a, of a tent. Right? It's, and he's referring to our bodies as being an example of that tent. It's not a permanent thing. You now, if you ask me, and if you think about it yourself, you're like, I, I, I feel kind of permanent, right? I feel kind of permanent. This kind of works. Why is Paul calling this body, this structure in which I inhabit, why is he calling it a tent? I mean, it works pretty good for the most part. But I think that even, even if should we live 100 years, in light of eternity, it's no time at all. It's a temporary reality. And so he calls and refers to our bodies really as tents and then starts reflecting on the things like, but there's going to come a day when we're going to have something that's much more permanent, something more akin to a house rather than a tent, something that's permanent rather than temporary. And that's what Paul's trying to get us to see in this passage. And then therefore, with that mentality to think, okay, well, I should be worried more about what's going on up there than down here. I should spend more time thinking about that, more investment in that one. And so Paul's point then is it, it does matter how we live here. right? It does matter how we do here and what we do in this life. But this body is not permanent. And we need to start living for the one where it is and, and when it is going to be permanent. So that's kind of Paul's logic as he's looking at this. So let's read a few of the verses here as we get going. We're going to start with the first five. He says this, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent we groan, being burdened not, but not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared, for, prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we're longing for a better home. Longing for a better home. That's really Paul's argument and point here as we're going through this. And it requires perspective. It does, in fact, require a perspective. And there, notice there's three words there, kind of phrases almost, in that first verse as you look at that. You're, you see destroy, you see build up, and you also see not made with hands. Now, at first glance, that may not be significant to you, but you think you've heard those words before. You've read those words before in other places in Scripture. And we can find them actually pretty easily if we look back to Mark chapter 14, verse 58. It says this, We heard him. Who's the him? Jesus, right? We heard him. We heard Jesus 
I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. And now Jesus, of course, was not talking about the actual, literal, physical Herod's temple that was being there. He was talking about his own body. He was like, this will be destroyed, but it will be built up again. But there's those words, destroyed, built up, and without hands. That's the words that we find going on in our passage here. Right? And that's what's going to happen to our physical bodies, too. Right? No matter how much time we spend trying to take care of them. And we should take some time taking care of it. But no matter how hard we try to take care of our bodies, no matter how much effort and investment we put in there, or dressing it up, or repairing it, or whatever it happens to be, at the end of the day, it's going to be destroyed. Now, how long is that going to take? It's anyone's guess. I don't know the future. For some of us, it's very young. For some of us, it's going to be very old. But it's not going to make it for the long haul. Maybe, as we said, 100 years at best. I said, well, that's not a very nice thing to say. I came to church this morning to be encouraged. He's like, you're going to be destroyed. I know, but this is what Paul's saying. And it is what will happen to the body, no matter how hard you try. There are, of course, those people that try to do that, to, to, to take matters into their own hands. You've heard of people trying to be like cryogenically frozen, right? Because they want, to, they, want to, they want to live forever, or they have a disease, and they okay, I'll freeze myself, and then they'll, they'll defrost me sometime later when, when they have a, a solution for this disease or whatever happens to ail me. As far as I know, nobody's ever been brought back from that. But people will take their lives, and, and I'm assuming you don't want to do it right, right when you're on death's door. I mean, you, you want to give yourself some time. So they're sacrificing life here and now in the moment. So in the hopes that one day later, sometime in the future, they'll be able to kind of be uh, brought back and do that. What are they trying to do? They're trying to preserve the body. They're trying to pre prevent their bodies from being destroyed. Even if that works. Even if that works. You maybe, maybe you escape this one disease. Maybe you escape this one issue. But there's going to be another one coming. Something else is still coming. Your body is still wearing out. The Bible says you're still going to be destroyed. And that's what we need to understand. And so to help us reconcile with this idea, he says, I want you to think about your body like this tent. I want you to think about it like a tent, kind of appropriate considering Paul made tents for a living. I, I do wonder if he wasn't like dictating this to someone and he's, he's literally working on a tent. He's like, I've got the perfect illustration. Let's talk about tents. And Paul understood what that meant. And they were important and they were much more functional and, and used in that day and age than they are today. But a tent is a poor substitute for a house. Paul's tents were most likely being used by soldiers, sometimes even travelers and other, other individuals like that. They would use those, they would, they would do that. And the problem with that is, beyond just not being permanent, the more you use it, the faster you wear it out. Packing it up, moving it around, and you know, they didn't have all the modern synthetic materials and things that we have today. They, they would get saturated, they would get wet, they would rot, they would tear. There was limited things and you would need to be replaced. It. it becomes a limiting factor here. No matter how hard you try to take care of it, it's still falling apart. I think we can see this maybe more likely if, if you know, Paul's using tents. I, I think if we put ourselves in the category of more of like a, like, a, like a car. You buy a new car, a new car to you. You get that. And you, you pull that off the lot, and you're, you're excited by it. You're like, man, this is beautiful, and, but i got to take care of it. And you, you wash it, and you wax it regularly. You go to Walmart, and you park as far away from the store as you possibly can. You, know, you can always tell the person that got the new car because it's all by itself. Like on the end, you're like, why did they park over it? Because they don't want you scratching it. You, you come to church and you normally park on this side, but you're like, they all have kids over there. I'm parking over here, <laughs> making sure, like, like okay, no, that person doesn't have any kids. Whoop, I'll park here because I want to get car doored. We try to take care of it. And then, you know, we get those initial scratches out of the way. Wisconsin has its way with it. It starts to get rusty. And, you know, finally gets to the point where it starts wearing out. And there's that day you take it to the mechanic and you go in there and he says, look, I, I hate to tell you, but this is not worth putting money into anymore. He said, but I love my car. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's at the end of the road. It's done. It's destroyed. It's been consumed. It's worn out. It's time for something new. It's time for another one. And we understand that in that concept, no matter how hard you try, it's just wore out. It's destroyed. You don't want to put any more money in it. It is just a car. And Paul's telling us our earthly bodies are like that, too. Like, take care of it. We're not suggesting not. Take care of it. 
but nevertheless, it's still wearing out. It's still falling apart. And he's not saying, like, okay, stop taking your vitamins, stop, you know, going to the doctor, stop, you know, eating well. He's not saying those things. But we need to take into account we're not going to last forever. No matter how hard we try. I told you years ago now, but at one time, like, someone once said, like, being healthy just means you're dying as slow as possible. <laughs> I know, isn't that encouraging? <laughs> but, but, I mean, but that's the reality. That is the reality. Being healthy just means you're dying as slowly as humanly possible. But the problem is you're still dying. We all are. From a moment of conception, a process has been started in our bodies that will ultimately end in our demise. But Paul goes on and says, but we have a building. Not a tent anymore, but a building. Not made with hands. That is eternal. What's amazing with this is that you have absolutely nothing to do in crafting it, or building it, or maintaining it. It's an eternal body, but it's one that's being given to you, and that's the key here. It's eternal, it's in heaven, it's in glory. And I do think that everybody gets this. I have to explain that a little bit, but I really do think that everybody gets this. Everybody gets a resurrected body. Everybody gets a resurrected body. Believers and unbelievers alike, everybody gets a resurrected body. But we have to clarify that a little bit. And we can talk about it later, too, because I, I think it's interesting. I don't think too many people put it like this, but I think we sometimes need to. Like, the body that we get at resurrection, regardless of what side of that you're on, is a very durable body. Just as durable, regardless of where that spends eternity. As you go through Scripture, we actually talk about resurrection. There's the first resurrection and second resurrection. We'll look at those verses in a minute. But to really understand resurrection, we need to think of not in terms of two, but as four resurrections. I think there's clearly four resurrections taking place in Scripture, the first of which is Christ's resurrection. Christ has a resurrected body. He comes back, and that, that's not a, um, a resurrection lo the likes of which there had taken place in the Old Testament, or even ones that Christ had done with other ones, like Lazarus or anything else, because they, they, they rose and they lived only to die another day. Jesus comes back and re-inhabits his body, and he walks out, and, and he is truly in a glorified body. It's unique, and it's new, and he's the first fruits of many brethren. He's not the first resurrection in history. That, that other people have that, that claim, and he's the first one to come back in a resurrected body, never to die again. And I don't think he's alone in that moment, because I think it's in Matthew, when there's that earthquake, other tombs open up, and saints, it seems like, are walking around. I think they might have been resurrected bodies, too. Jesus then then, limited. But then you go beyond that, and I think for us as, as believers here, New Testament saints, we look forward to a rapture, but there's also a resurrection for some people in that moment. I think there's a second resurrection. So we have those going on here, but then we also have what Revelation 20 describes as the first resurrection. It's here. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their, their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. He's talking about those in verse 4, those who are probably Old Testament saints, tribulation saints, those who died for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus. They refused to bow the knee to the, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the beast and, and its image, and those in the Old Testament that refused to, to, to fall down and worship those false idols and were killed for it. Like all those, those, those are there. Those are the first resurrection saints according to their... But the rest of the dead, he says, didn't come up until what? Till later. I think it's here in John 5, 29. And come out those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. See, when we think about this and we understand this, I think, a little bit better, we realize what, what makes eternal life different than eternal damnation? I think it's really Jesus. Who's wiping away the tears? Who's giving us a wonderful place to live? Who's doing all these, these things for us? What makes that such a great place to spend eternity? It's Jesus that's doing that. It's not the quality of the body. 
And I think the body of those who spend an eternity in damnation is just as durable as the one that's in glory. It's the location of the body that matters, not, not the, the, uh, the, the quality of the body. It's the location. It changes everything. Everyone is resurrected, I think, in that capacity, in that way. But Paul specifically here in our passage is talking to believers. He's talking about this eternal body. Where is it? In heaven. It's in glory. He's talking clearly here about believers. He assumes that they're in Christ. And so he refers to them that way. But that does not mean that everyone who maybe, everyone might receive an, uh, a resurrected body, but it doesn't mean that every resurrected body spends eternity in heaven. It doesn't. And the question I have for you is, where is your resurrected body going to spend eternity? Because if you're outside of Christ, then you have no hope. You have no hope. Paul's not actually talking to you here in this passage. He, he wants to be able to talk to you, but, but if you're outside of Christ, if you have not put your faith, hope, and trust in Christ and Christ alone to save you because of your sin that is separated from, you, from God, you have to understand that your resurrected body is going to spend an eternity in punishment that will not end. Why not? Because you have a resurrected body that's durable. It's a terrifying reality. And there are those that want to try and talk about the fact, no, you people go to hell, they're burned up and they're consumed. No! You have a durable, resurrected body that you're resurrected and driven towards judgment. Nobody dies in hell. Or if you want to put it another way, like people die forever in hell. It's eternal damnation. It's a terrible place. And Paul's talking about this. If you're not making your house, you're not thinking about your house this way, you're, not, you're, not, you're, 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 uh, you're doing this. Like you're, you're not the one that actually makes the house. God's the one that does this. But in the Spirit, He refines it. He saves us. He brings us all the way home. You don't earn it. It's a gift that simply needs to be accepted. And the sin that separated you in the first place and necessitates the existence of hell itself in Christ has been dealt with. Please don't miss that. But there's only hope in Christ. As George Guthrie says, we're not going to be spending time as going back into our passage here more directly. But, you know, as we're doing this, so we're in the tent of the house is coming there. It's over there. We're, we're not going to spend eternity as disembodied spirits. I think there's a time where that will be true, but he cites actually someone by the name of Tom Wright who has kind of this famous line, this famous phrase, life after life after death. And at first glance, it's like, what? Life after life after death? It doesn't make sense, but it does. And he says we need to really think about resurrection maybe almost in two phases. There's life after death, right? Which is exactly what Jesus says to the thief on the cross. Remember, he confesses his belief. Remember me, Jesus, right? And what does Jesus say to him? Today you will be with me in paradise. Right? Today, life after death. Today you will be with me in paradise. Right? There, there's a promise of life there. You'll be there. That, that's, a, that's a huge promise. But was the thief on the cross in that day resurrected? No. No. I think the best way to put it is a disembodied spirit. His body, literal physical body, is in the ground. His spirit, his soul, was with God, his Jesus. But there's going to be a change to that. We need to think of resurrection almost like a, a two-stage process. There's this, this moment where to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord right here. And so we, we see that. But something else changes that. And that's what Thomas, uh, t uh, Tom Wright is trying to get after here, too. There's a second stage, which is when our spirit returns, re-inhabits our body. And we go to live in a new created world that God has, has restored creation. You know, when we talk about, we can kind of actually see this pretty easily, I think. When we talk about Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, when, when, when the first generation believers, the New Testament saints and believers, they talked about that, they did not mean that Jesus was crucified and that he died and that his soul went to be with God and that was a resurrection. Right? I mean, we follow that, right? We're, we're there. You guys are just out of it. <laughs> the turkey is in the air or what? I don't know. Do you get that, right? Like that, that was not, like to say that was not unique. The Romans believed in Elysium. 
right? They're, they're, uh, there's, I don't know, it's the Hindus, I always get them confused. Like, they, they believe in this, this concept of nirvana, and there's the oversoul, there's, there's paradise. For the Muslims, like, to, to be absent from the body, to be in some other greater place was not unique to Christianity. What was unique to Christianity was the resurrection. When three days later, Christ comes, re-inhabits his body, and he walks out the front door of the tomb. Nobody said that. Nobody claimed that. Until the Christians. Until Christ did it, and the Christians go out there, and they start telling everybody, no, Jesus has risen from the dead. That's a resurrection. Resurrection implies a bodily a body getting up and moving being re-inhabited by its former owner, so to speak. That was unique to Christianity. And the Christians start telling everybody about that. And that's why everybody, that's why, that's why Christianity spreads the way that it does, because nobody had, had said that. Nobody claimed that before. And the Christians are going out there and saying, no, 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 Christ has risen from the dead. And they have hundreds of eyewitnesses in an empty tomb to back it up. And everybody's looking at it and going, this is real. Like this actually happened. There is an empty tomb over there. There's nobody in it. Christ came back and was raised from the dead. It wasn't simply that his soul went to be with God, but his body was still there in the tomb. That's not a resurrection. He's talking about a resurrection where it's life after, life after death. So it's a two-stage process that Paul is really talking about here. And the reality is that for those who are in Christ, we will be like Jesus. There's a resurrection that is coming in which our souls will re-inhabit our bodies. That's a beautiful thing. And that's what he's talking about here. But there's also this concept of being sealed. While we wait for our house, we groan. It's not because we're looking at the price of building materials. Ooh, uh-oh. That's not it. There's a deep-seated longing. There's a deep-seated longing to be there. To have the fulfillment of true redemption actually take place. Like, like we're all the way home. We're all the way there. It's fullest and complete extent. What it means to truly be saved. Paul's not longing here just be unclothed as if this body is somehow inhibiting his spirit from being and doing all that was destined to be. It's not that he's just supposed to be freed from this and that's all it is. No, no, no. It, it's like he wants, he wants the house. He wants the, the fuller and full effect of that. He goes, it's almost like I want to, I'm, I'm clothed in the tent. I want to be more finely clothed in the house. Like I'm glad for this. I'm thankful for this tent, but I, I but I want the house. I want to I want to move over to that. I want to put on more, not less. And he's assured that that will happen because he has the spirit deep within inside of him. Second Corinthians one twenty two. We talked about this before. And who God who has also put His seal on us and given us His spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. You understand? Like if you have the spirit of God living in you, you are guaranteed to make it all the way. You have this eternal house that, God, that, that Paul is talking about here, not made with hands. It's there. It's, it, and you have this proof that you carry with you. There's all kinds of ways that in the ancient world people would, would use to, kind of, to, to prove they were who they said they were, that, that something was true. The Roman legions often had um, the, the SPQR tattooed on their arms to signify that they were part of the Roman legion. It's who they were. It was an insignia. It was a mark in which to be able to say that for the Senate and people of Rome. Basically, Roman military. They had that. You know, kings would take a wax seal, and, or a wax and a seal, and put it on paper and mark it somehow so that to kind of prove, like, this paper is for me. This person is official. We do that today with basically a notary public. We, people will, will mark that in some capacity, saying, like, no, I witnessed this. I, I can prove this. It goes on. Uh, uh, American citizens, really citizens of every country, they have passports. These documentations, this person really is who they say they are. They really are an American citizen. We walk around and we prove that. You know, for Christians, we have kind of a passport too, a, a holy passport, if you will. And rather than a piece of paper that can be lost or stolen or faked, we have the Spirit of God living within us. What better way to prove that you're part of something than actually have a part of that with you? Let me introduce you to the Spirit of God. That's what we carry. It's what we have within inside of us. And, and I think it's First John talks about his spirit ministers with our spirit, that we truly are the, the, the children of God, the sons and daughters of God. And we carry that with us everywhere we go. And with that promise says, here, here's, here's a peace more to come. 
And that's always been the point. Here, you get a piece of God, so to speak, the Spirit who is with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll, you'll, you'll always be there. But there's more to come. And when we go to glory, we get the rest of God, so to speak. We get that full relationship. And it's a beautiful thing. I hope you're longing for a better home. It's easy not to. But one of the reasons we long for that home is because it offers a better future. It's the next several verses here that we want to look at, but longing for this better future. Let's read 6 through 10. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Be of good courage, he says. Be of good courage. It's kind of the flip side of don't lose heart. To be encouraged this way. Um, if we're here, then we're not there. And I know that can be like obvious, but Paul's really telling us there's really only two places you can be. It's, it's here in the present moment, like we all are in this room, or we can be with God up in glory. There, there's no other place to be. There's not a, there's not a multi-step process. It's, you're here or you're there. And one of the things I think he says that to us for is just to, to be patient, to keep going, right? Don't give up. Have that eternal perspective. It's coming. It's happening. Live the life that God has for you. And there he says in verse 7, like we have to walk by faith, not by sight. Paul said it's actually something similar last week in, first, uh, in uh, 4.18. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We have to remind ourselves that what we see day in and day out are transient things. They're earthly and failing things. But it is what we see. It is what we see. It's We look around and this is all we can see. This is all, and we take it in and think that, that's the only way it's possible. That's the only thing that it can be. It's what we see. And, and he, Paul's talking about we have, to, we have to go with what we know. What we know to be true based on the word of God, not what we see. And that's, that's not blind faith. People like to put it in a category of blind faith, and I know why they do. They do it because of passages like Hebrews 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. But again, George Guthrie comes to our rescue here and helping us to remember, like, the, the faith that he's talking about here is actually light, is, is a step in the light. It's a step in the light based on the actual revealed word of God. And you start reading through Hebrews 11, like the rest of it, because it's the hall of faith. It's just person after person after person and the way in which they followed and exercised faith. And it's like, but God told them to do something. God had told Abraham, look, I'm going to give you a child, but you've got to wait and not try to go outside the normal realms of acquiring that child. See, that's not blind faith. There's instruction there. Is it a lot of instruction? No. Is it all the instruction that he wanted? No. But it's enough. And you go through that person after person after person. They knew something. They knew enough. They knew what God was telling them to do. They had some nugget of truth in which they were to base everything off of. What so often passes in blind faith that we talk about is really more out of existentialism than anything else. It's what Friedrich Nietzsche and, and many others that were, that were uh, died in the little atheist, if you will, talked about this, this nonsensical blind faith of just this nothingness. Do you determine your own future? You determine your own meaning and purpose for existence in life. Do whatever you want to do and hope for the best and then it'll work out. That's not what we have in faith, it's in Christ. That's not at all what we have in Christ. It made me think of this verse, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your path, your direction is not blind. You can see. He talks about picking up his word, and you think about, especially in that day, the, the lamps and the lights that they might have, holding it out in, in the middle of the night when the moon is, is gone, and you're, you're walking around trying to see, and you can see a little bit. You can see well enough to take that next step. And that's about it. 
Can you see your destination? Probably not. I mean, you think about I mean, we, we see these all the time, actually, in action, because, you know, you're traveling home at night, and what inevitably is on the road? Okay, besides the deer. Things with lights. An Amish buggy. I thought that was a given, but there's deer, but there's an Amish buggy out there, and, you know, they, they got their little lanterns on, and it, it oh, it's dumbfounding. So you see that tiny little light. I don't know. It doesn't look like it lights up anything. I don't, I'd be interested to see it from their point of view rather than mine. But, I mean, I, I can't see the buggy. I can't see the road from, from where they're at. I mean, it looks like just a candle. It's so, you know, they must be able to see something. But you think about how dim that really is and how far ahead that light that actually casts light. They can't see very far. But it must be just enough that that horse can see its next step. Where they can say, hey, there's a ditch, I'll pull the horse over just a little bit. It's just enough. And often that's all God gives us too. I'll show you how to take your next step. I'll show you where you need to go. It's, I'm not going to show you over there. I'm just going to show you here. So take that step. And we get, and by faith, not blind, we can see, but not far. And we take that step. And now we can see enough to take the next one. And when we take the next one, we slowly go there. How long is the path? I have no idea. How long are we going to be on this journey? I have no idea. My destination might be three steps away. It might be five miles. I don't know. That's, that's the element of faith. And too many times we can abandon our path on faith because like this doesn't go anywhere. And we try to go back to where we think we can actually see again rather than trusting what we know because we don't like it. I really like the way that Dane Orland puts this. He, he wants this to be our mental neutral. He wants verse 7 to be our mental neutral of our ordinary lives. You're probably thinking, what does that even mean? I know. But I, but I think, what he, what he, he doesn't want us to take verse 7, pull it out of context, and when we come across something in life that doesn't make sense, some kind of a curiosity, and then default into, oh, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. There we go. It's like, I don't know how to explain this in any other way. I'm going to start walking by faith, not by sight. He doesn't want that to, that to be what we do. I liken it to this way. You know, you get a, uh, you buy a truck, you get a, a truck and, you know, you have a four-wheel drive capability. Most of the time you're not driving around in your truck in four-wheel drive. Right? You don't need it. Even today, it's cold out, winter's knocking on our door, but we're not driving around in four-wheel drive. The truck doesn't handle so well that way. You get terrible mileage. You're wearing out your tires. There's all kinds of reasons why it's not a great idea to drive around in four-wheel drive all the time. We drive around two-wheel drive, and we can go through the Christian life that way too, right? We're just going based on what we see, what we're doing, and all of a sudden we hit an obstacle. We hit snow. We hit a blood bag. We had some kind of a disease or something like that, and all of a sudden we're like, oh, right? When life gets tough, the tough get four-wheel drive, baby, and off we go, right? Is that faith? Right? Oh, oh, defaulting back into, you know, faith over sight. Is that what Paul wants us to do? No. Not at all. He says, I want you to drive around in four-wheel drive all the time. Never take it out. It's to be our mental neutral. It's to be our default position. We do all of life by faith, not sight. I was this little kid, probably four or five. My dad, I don't exactly know why he bought this, but he, he brought home this 70-something Dodge truck. And it felt old at the time. I know it was probably only, you know, maybe 10 years older. This was probably like 1983 or something. This was like 1970. So cool truck, cool truck. This ugly 70s gold and white. I don't know what they were thinking, but... And they had this extended cabin. I had the cool jumper seats in the back and whatever. So I remember as a kid jumping in this thing, like four or five, and you know, sitting on these seats, like, this is the coolest thing ever. And, and loving it. And my dad was like, be careful. Be careful, because there's something laying on the floor. And he said, I don't want you to get greasy or roll over your foot. And, and I don't think this is factory. I think something is broken. But the, the front drive shaft that went from the transfer case to the, the front axle was in the back seat on the floor just rolling around. So I'm assuming something was broken. I don't, I don't think that's factory, Chris. I, I mean, you know, I know it's a Dodge, but I mean, I don't think that's factory. But it would roll around. And you know, here I am, this little kid, and you know, you're driving, and it's rolling around all over the floor, and you, you don't want it to, to go over your toes. It's not like the aluminum ones they have now. It's this big, heavy piece of metal that's rolling around. It's all greasy. And, and he says, well, if you need four-wheel drive, then you've got you to put it in. And I'm like, 
um, okay. And you, know, you look back at it now, you're like, that's the dumbest thing ever. See, we look, we look at this illustration and we think, we, we think that we're going through life, we'll go through two wheel drive, we'll go through sight, and if something happens, we reach up like we do in basically any modern vehicle in the last 20 years. We need four wheel drive, we need to, dr to fall into faith, and we reach over and we hit the four wheel drive button. And it just shifts and off we go, right? Not that easy. It's really not that easy. The reality is it, it, that's a hard distinction. We have much more in common with that old truck where all of a sudden something doesn't go well and we have a hard time. And the reality is to really start living by faith, not by sight, it's akin to opening the door, grabbing that axle, climbing under the truck that is now currently stuck and trying to install that thing and then climbing back out and getting into the truck again and thinking, okay, now we can just go. It's not an instantaneous thing. It's not something you just push the button, get into, push the button, get out of. It's hard. And the reality is that I think 9 out of 10 people in that truck, if they got stuck, rather than grabbing that axle and putting it up underneath, they're like, I'm done. And they walk away. Because it's really not that easy to go through life and live it normally, if you will, and all of a sudden things get hard and think, okay, I'm going to default into faith now. It's not that easy. And you're fooling yourself if you think, I could just drop in and out of living life by faith whenever I want to. You can't. Once you learn it, once you understand that, the, the reality that wants us to do is get in four-wheel drive and stay there. Get in it and stay there. I think too many people have walked away because they didn't understand that concept that he's talking about here. We walk by faith, not by sight, all the time. It should be our mental neutral, our default position, always living faith, life by faith, not sight. When you start doing that, but I guess I should say, it, it, it's hard to do that. It really is hard to do that. And when we forget, right, because sight makes that really hard. It makes it really difficult. We start to forget that. And inevitably what we do is we start painting our tents. I know that makes absolutely no sense, but it's not supposed to. See, we start living for now. Like, nobody paints their tent. It's like, why would you do that? You do that because you forget that it's a tent. You've forgotten that, that like, this, this is temporary. You start living for the here and for the now. You start taking care of your tent as if it's a house. You start taking care of your tent as if it's going to be this permanent dwelling, which we're always going to be here. And, and you're forgetting, no, 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 that eternal thing, that permanent thing is up there in heaven. We forget that. We start living for the here and for the now. We take care of our body. We start being consumed with the things that life has to offer. We start painting our tent. We start putting a new roof on our tent. We start replacing all the windows in our tent. We start building a deck on the back of our tent. The neighbors are looking at us, what are they doing? Nobody does that. You do if you forget. And that's Paul's point. This body, this life, it's gonna be destroyed. Are you living for eternity? Are you living for that house up there that cannot be destroyed, that is eternal? Or are you living like this tent is all that there is? He says, don't live like that. Remember your house. That's what he talks about here. When you live like this, by faith, not by sight, you're living the way that God wants us to do. It's our aim then to please God in everything that we say, everything that we do. We have the right perspective. I would rather be there, not here. I, I long to be there. I, I want to be there. I want to please God in everything I do. This is just a tent. Nothing more. And then in verse 10, finally, he says, be ready to make an appearance. All those who are in Christ, all those who are in Christ are going to stand before the judgment seat there. How do we think about that? Well, that judgment seat is not the great white throne judgment. That's later in Revelation 20. But this is something that all believers will stand before God and give an account for what they've done in their tent. And what are you going to say? Right? What are you going to say? Notice in that, that verse 10 there, too. 
He says, for what, what was done in the body, whether good or evil. So it's a judgment. It's kind of an evaluation. How have you lived life? There, there really are and can be good things that you have done in this life for the glory of God. There really can be. See, at the great white throne judgment, those that are outside of Christ, is they're, they're in the resurrected body, but it's going to go into eternal damnation. There's, there's no good things they can point to. They did all of life outside of Christ. There's no good. There's good here. So there's an evaluation. What was done with eternity in mind and what was done here with a tent in mind? So there's a judgment here. Was it for selfish things or things that will last? I think 1 Corinthians 3.12 helps us to understand or think through this a little bit better. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. But if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. You know, fire or judgment comes, and it will re reveal the true value of things. It really does. And, and I think there, there are so many things in this life that we spend so much time on that are more akin to firewood and kindling than gold. We get consumed by those things. And to remember, it, it does matter how we keep this tent. It does matter what we do with it. It does. Don't, don't hear me wrong on that. But at the same time, he wants us to have the right perspective that living for things, that, that we not live for the right now. This life matters, but it's not all that there is. Paul's reminding us there's so much more in the future, and we need to be just in, in, that, in that constant state of looking up, to live by faith, not by sight, to live by what we know to be true rather than what we can just simply see at any given moment. Sight will lead you astray all the time. Somewhere in there, oh, here it is. It was Marcus Aurelius that said, what we do now echoes in eternity. I don't think that's how he meant it, but he was exactly right. What we do now echoes in eternity, matters in eternity. How are you living and spending your time in the tent? Are you remembering that you have a house that God is building for you that you will spend an eternity in? Or are you living as if this tent is all that there is? Our real home is not here. And we need to stop living as if it is. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we do thank you for this instruction. Lord, I know for myself, it is very easy to get attached to the things of this world. It is very easy to get attached to the way that people view me. It's very easy to look around and think, I would like that. I want that. I want to avoid this. And I'm guessing I'm not the only one here. I think it's also easy, well, maybe not easy, but needful, maybe, to admit that more often than not, we don't live with verse 7 in mind. We live by sight, not by faith. We're based on things that we do and that we want based on what we can see. Instead of, Lord, truly living by faith on what we know to be true based on the revealed word that you have given to each and every one of us. Lord, I pray you would help us to, to change our perspective and our motivations that we would truly make it our aim to please you in all that we say, in all that we do. And Lord, when it gets hard and we want to throw in the towel because people are looking at us strangely or we're not being as successful in an area as we once were or we wish we were, that you would remind us gently and lovingly that, Lord, we're to be living by faith. And just to stay the course. So please, Lord, 
help us instill in us that desire to please you no matter the cost. In Christ's name, amen. For all those